Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Lisa Ann's Backstage Convos. I appreciate you being here with me as I get to share so many incredible entertainers with you that visit through the family of Sapphire Clubs. You've got three locations in New York City, Times Square, 39th, 60th Street, and in Vegas, the epic, the large, the incredibly crazy. You can rent rooms. There's so many things you can do at these clubs, but today it's just me. No entertainer here with me, and I thought I would take from the pool of questions that I get asked the most, whether it's in my email, on social media, or in other podcast interviews, is all about my pivot and the why and the understanding of the transition of lives that I've lived and the things that I've been involved in and the why. And what I most important like to express is the fact that from my fans that have known me for many years, one way, just in the adult business, doing scenes, doing appearances, everything else, I get a lot of, can you just come back and do one more scene? Can you just come back and do this for a little bit longer? But what I wouldn't write, remind everybody is, I'm still very present. So though the one thing I don't do anymore is shoot scenes, which was a personal choice. I enjoyed my time in the industry so much, but it got to the point where my health and the value that I placed on myself was a little bit different, but I still kept a lot of things. I go to all the Exotica shows. I hosted every Sapphire in New York City, as well as in Vegas. I do other events at clubs and a lot of sex positive shows all over the world. Two years ago, I went to Switzerland for Ecstasia. Last year, I went to Greece and did a show there, which was incredible. The end of the year, I went to Australia for Sexpo, and I get to still be Lisa Ann. I know for many people coming and going in the industry, it's kind of different because if you haven't implanted yourself for as many years as maybe I did, it's a little bit, okay, this was just something I did, but this isn't just something I did. This is just who I am. It's a huge part. I mean, it is the fiber, the main fiber of my existence was the fact that I grew into myself as a woman while I was in the industry, while I was on the road, while I was dancing. I connected myself with so many people around the world in this space, and I loved the comfort I felt with them. And that's why I never felt the need to like exit everything, not talk about my previous adult life, not run in OnlyFans, not stay engaged with my fans. I thought it was just as important to know that you all should know that I'm so proud of everything that I put out there, that I shared with you, that you enjoyed, and that you still enjoy. But there became a point in time where I started to get involved in doing other things. And in 2010, I had a radio show on Spice Radio. It was Playboy Radio. It was called Stripper Town. It was every Monday night. It was such a fun show. I would have people calling in and telling stories of things that happened to them at strip clubs. I would have girls coming in that were going out on the road as feature dancers, and I would interview them. And it was kind of then inspired by Christy Canyon and watching Christy Canyon, who had a successful show on Vivid Radio for years, a five-day-a-week show for years on Sirius XM. And I can remember my first couple of interviews with, with Christy realizing how present she was, how we would be doing this interview and like 10 minutes in, she would go to a little reminder of, I'm talking to Lisa Ann right now, you can follow her here. I just saw this skill set and I was drawn to it. What I realized that I have in common with Christy is we both love to communicate, we're both very curious, we both wanna be engaged with our fan base, but this was the perfect medium. And so watching Christy and then getting involved with my own show, Stripper Town, led me kind of down this rabbit radio hole. And for the three years that I constantly was every Monday night, Monday night during football season, Monday night football. In the studio at Playboy Radio, Spice Radio, what it was all the times as I was working there, there were no TVs and I could not see what was going on during the Monday night football game. So a lot of my fans would call in, they'd lie and say they had a stripper story and they'd get me on the phone. It was so cool to still be in a studio with a, a live phone, you know, or you just pick it up. Uh, and I'd answer and they'd tell me an update on the game. And so I'd know who was winning, maybe who got injured. And I wasn't playing fantasy football yet. I was just a sports fan. And my fans that met me on the road, that heard me on their local radio station, they knew that I loved basketball and football, that I was starting to get into baseball. But I would go to baseball games and hockey games as well when I was on the road. And it gave me a real 
comfort and common ground with each community that I was visiting because I became part of their community by going to a Pittsburgh Pirates game, by going to see the Cavs play, by learning what it looked like inside their arenas and ballparks and what foods and different things they all had. And it gave me a really nice layer of conversation to have with fans that would come to see me regularly. You can only talk about my scenes for so long till we know we could hold a longer conversation and talk about something else. And by me learning about their city and their teams, I was able to offer up things that I knew when I would visit the sports station to promote my future dance gigs on the road. And so fans would come in and be like, oh, I heard you on the radio this morning. I love that you knew this, what have you. And it was instant for me to understand that this was another layer of communication in the same demo mainly male demo, knowing that I could talk sports even if I was completely naked at a strip club with a fan that heard me on the radio. So of course, this did not fly very well, getting people to lie to my producer, say they had a strip club story, and then bring that strip store to me and tell me what was going on in the Monday night game live on air. I was written up a couple of times. My producer was cool about it, but they really wanted me to be sexier and I really wanted to know what was going on during the Monday night game. And eventually my producer came to me and said, hey, my friend Matt in New York City had a fantasy football show. It just broke up and it was all Playboy Playmates. He's looking for something similar. This was spring of 2013. This was also a year where I was really starting to get concerned about my health and my well-being in the industry. In 2013, we had more health shutdowns than we had had since the long shutdown in the late 90s. I mean, we were probably shut down six months of the year. It would be a 30-day here, a 20-day here, a two-month hold. And these shutdowns are because something is in the industry. Everybody needs to get tested multiple times. Everybody needs to wait. The waiting wasn't a problem for me because I had many other things I was doing. I always had my feature dance bookings planned way in advance. So even though everybody would be out there looking for work, those jobs were already taken. I already had my store appearances, my nightclub stuff, because shooting scenes was such a small portion of not only my, my monthly activities, my income, everything else. It was just a small thing that I did. With it being that I always was shooting a movie a month, I would then realize like, oh, I'm gonna take this great health risk to do something that I'm only doing a couple days a month, but I have all of these other things going. So when my producer came to me and said, hey, let's introduce you to my friend Matt in New York. I was like, I'll reach out to Matt right away. I will fly to New York and meet him right away and I will get this thing going. So that May, 2013, I flew here to New York City to go into Sirius XM to meet my boss at became my boss, Matt. And Matt asked me, do you know fantasy football? I know you know a lot about sports. I've heard a lot about your conversations about sports. I was like, no, but I will spend this entire summer and I will work on this. So Matt sent me into a studio to meet with somebody that he thought would be a good co-host. That studio was live on air at the time. So I got to go in and just jump in live and see how well I could work my cadence with two hosts that I had never worked with before. I got pretty good at that, you know, 20 years plus 20 plus years on the road feature dancing and going into a radio show, I try to do every booking uh, and know that after Palin 2008, for four years, I did 50 feature gigs a year. That means I was on the road 50 weekends a year because I knew that was where the real bread and butter was going to come from. And I also knew that I was only going to be able to have that pop for some period of time. So I wanted to really take advantage of playing Sarah Palin for the Who's Nail and Palin series for Hustler, being in the Eminem video for the song We Made You as Sarah Palin. All of these things that happened, I knew brand awareness, I need to capitalize on this right away. So on the road, all that. So a lot of reps walking into radio stations with two or three hosts that I've never met and, and feeling the cadence. And that's a very important thing when you're a radio listener, which I also am, is not having dead airspace. Because one second on the radio when you're driving in your car makes you panic and almost change the channel. Makes you think your stereo shut off. Makes you think something happened. So by the time I go into this studio to meet my, who then would be my co-host, Adam Ronis, I realize right away he's a Dallas Cowboys fan. We have endless banter back and forth, and it's a fit. So right then I knew in May, I was going to be doing a fantasy football show starting that August on Sirius XM in the same time slot where I had been Monday nights. 
keeping me on air in that same time slot was so perfect for me because I knew that I would be just pulling people from what I was already doing. All of the fans that were kind enough to give me the updates on the Monday night game would actually get to communicate me now on a show where we also could take some calls on fantasy football. So 2013 summer was spent not only studying, mock drafting, reaching out to every one of my friends that plays fantasy football and asking them for one tip. And I can pretty much, when I see each one of those friends, remember like my friend Dave told me he always drafts a kicker that's home stadium is a dome. So he never has to worry about weather. I was like, oh, okay, I get that, all right. Everyone gave me a tip. I spent that summer mock drafting, learning the sport, learning the pl getting all the magazines, listening to Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio eight to 10 hours a day easily while I was also getting an apartment in the city. I could have done this show from the LA studio and my co-host and I would have just been in different studios, but I just really didn't want to do that. The excitement that I felt that very first day I walked into Sirius XM with the potential of working there, as opposed to with the just potential of being a guest as I had been many times in the past was real. I was like, this feels right. This feels like a move that could really teach me something ground me, uh, give me a new friendship group, give me something new to talk about, and this is really what I want to do. So I found myself a studio, which was a block from the Sirius XM state radio station, from the building. And I remember with my realtor that day, we were looking at four places, three or four places. It was raining, I remember that. And this was the first one we looked at, was this studio. And the blinds were closed, and when I opened the blinds, I could see Sirius XM. And I said to him, this is the apartment I'm taking. I can see work. I don't want to be in this train. I don't want to be, you know, you have to look at the other places. So like you do, because a realtor feels like you have to, I looked at the other places. I am so glad I took that studio because as soon as I got that studio, everyone at Sirius XM knew I was close enough to come in and do guest spots whenever I wanted, whenever they wanted me to. If I'm in the city and I'm across the street, yeah, I'm going to come in. You need a last minute interview. You need a fill in spot. I'm going to do it. Because one of the things I learned over that summer when I was studying fantasy football and listening to the channel was how many hosts from other shows did guest spots on other shows and what a big family this whole network was. That was also when I put two and two together and said, oh, this is a business where you're going to do a lot of things for free because you are. You're not going to get paid for guest spots. You're not going to get paid, but this is going to be what I considered an education a different way to, to get a degree, to get reps on the radio, to build my confidence on the radio and to get my foot in the door with a large company that could teach me more than I knew in the space that I was already in. So I get my studio, I start coming in on all these guest spots, I start getting really embedded with the team at SiriusXM, different people that you see at different times, different morning shows that I would visit regularly and eventually was offered to take classes. So Sirius XM provides broadcast classes. They have people coming in and talking to you about different things. So I was like, sign me up for absolutely everything. And that was really the beginning of my pivot was that 2013. My first show, I remember my best friend said to me, I had a one-year contract. And she said, you can either be a flash in the pan that is utilized for social media traffic or... You can become so good at this that they just can't fire you, that they have to renew your show. And that was when I realized if I get a new contract offered to me in 2014, then that was gonna be 100% my absolute, I was going to be leaving the business and just the scenes end of that. At that time, I didn't know I was gonna be living in New York full time, but I just knew that I wanted to focus more on what was new and in front of me than what I had already seen. And again, flashing back to 2013, People that know me well know this, but not everybody knows that I have psoriasis. And psoriasis is something that you'll always have. It's a skin disorder. And it can flare up when you're very stressed. It can flare up if you're sick. Medications can make it flare up. So during that year where we were doing shutdowns, there were a couple of times, one in particular that really stands out, where the industry kind of got together and said to us as talent, if you're all willing to take this shot, you can come back to work in two weeks. But if you're not willing to take the shot, you have to wait another six weeks or so. I knew I couldn't take the shot because anything could make my psoriasis flare up. And I was already mildly flaring up from the stress that I had going on. And I didn't want to be in the talent pool with people that took a shot to go back to work for two weeks. and We don't know what's next. 
went to each clinic asking, can you please give me the breakdown of what's in this shot so that I can take it to my doctor and see if it's going to have potential flare up with my skin. No, nobody could tell me what was in it. So for many of my fans that don't understand, there was not a time where I didn't love doing scenes, but there was a time where I just took to myself and said, okay, you've had a great run. You've been healthy. You're still healthy. Do you want to continue to kind of roll the dice on this situation? Does it seem realistic, smart? Probably not. I didn't do the shot. I refused to put a shot in my body that you couldn't tell me what was in it. And that was when I kind of also got a little sus, a little conspiracy theory-ish, and a little bit worried about performing. Though I still continued to perform for another year, I, at that point, would pay for each of my co-stars to get a fresh test the day before. I would do everything that I could to make sure that I was in the bubble of as much safety as possible. But during that time, my main focus was sports radio. My main focus was learning how to be a better broadcaster, a better communicator, a better speaker, and having something else to put on my resume that would not just help me for my future, but would help me for every interview I do for the business, for every trade show that I get invited to, to every speaking engagement. All of those things were just going to be better, and they were not something that I had to ever work on while I was in the industry. So that kind of was the beginning of the pivot. And when my second contract came was when I realized, okay, this is going to be real and this is going to allow me time to pull back and finish my first book. Writing your first book is so time consuming because you overwrite and over edit everything. And I was a much wordier person then though it does seem crazy as I'm sitting here talking by myself to just you, uh, like I'm not still wordy, but wordy in the sense of just could tell a story in a more compact way later on. But I took that year, 2014, to kind of prepare myself to pull away from doing scenes. I filled that void by preparing myself that I was going to be releasing my new book a year after I retired and had all these forward thinking plans. Those plans allowed me to meet so many new people. And if it wasn't for me taking these chances and saying, I'm gonna get this apartment in New York City, best thing I could have ever done. It got me embedded with my coworkers to the point where even being without Sirius XM from 2021 to 2023, and now back with Sirius XM again, I was just in the building today and it's amazing how many people are still there that I knew had been there for years and I get to have you know, brief conversation with, catch up. That is where I really gained a lot of my confidence outside of the business. Of course, you can imagine I was very confident in the business, but it was also my entire life. And for me to test the waters and see who else I could be and what else I could do, this was really the perfect move. And I sit here now with this podcast. I have my own podcast, the Lisa Ann Experience. And between 2013 and 2024, a lot has happened in me trying new things, getting involved with new businesses, aligning with new partnerships, taking some gambles, winning some, losing some, all of the things that make life exciting. I just wasn't feeling that excitement anymore doing the exact same things and having the exact same worries. Those worries become time consuming and taxing and kind of wear down on you. So as I made that choice, I took a step back and I didn't do any trade shows for a couple of years and I didn't do as many appearances as I'm doing right now. And each year as I journal at the end of the year, I realized I missed it. I realized I missed seeing my fans at Exotica because Exotica is a place unlike AVN, which is great, but it's so loud and crowded and it's really hard to engage. Exotica is a place where you can stand and have a 10 minute conversation with your fan if you want to. You know, you have, you're running your own booth, nobody's rushing you. And I realized I missed that. So in 2017 was the first of me going back and reaching out and saying, hey, you know, I'd love to see how I feel about doing an Exotica and maybe get back on track with doing all of the locations. And it was just like instant. It wasn't even just the fans. It was people that I knew from the booths for years. Performers, friends, Christy Canyon, Ginger Lynn, Tara Patrick, you know, all of these people that though we might have kept in touch on social media, we weren't having dinners or lunches together. We weren't seeing each other four times a year. So I realized, huh, funny, my family is greater than I thought. My family unity really started as I grew and developed myself as a person in the industry. It makes perfect sense that I feel so comfortable 
at a trade show, Exotica, with my fans and friends, at Sapphire, hosting events and chilling. And now I love the fact that so many of my fans that have known me from many things, but now can sit and engage with me in a really developed sports conversation or talk about an author that I had on my podcast. And it's really nice to be seen for something other than what you've already known. And I think it's a lot of work and it can be very discouraging. And it was something that I was prepared for. But even today, I posted something about being so excited about this new show that I'm doing on Sirius XM Raw Comedy because I think I kind of found my sweet spot. It's comedy. I'm the host. I have a comedian with me, Brett Raybould. He's hilarious. We bring in other comedians. My producer's amazing. I get to be in the building. The vibes are high. And I get to laugh and kind of jockey back and forth to make sure I've reintroduced it. I get to be Christy Canyon, how she was to me when I first was on her show uh, on Vivid Radio. And so... I put a post out about how happy I am that, you know, I take my broadcast experience and it's not as sports, it's sports, you have to study a lot. You're always paying attention. If you don't know an injury that just happened, you go on air, you're a fool. All of these things, no pressure. Now I'm telling jokes, hearing jokes, and I'm also sharing more stories about the industry than I ever shared because I never had a forum to really share them. I'm not just going to talk about it on my podcast because I know my podcast will get shadow banned and everything else, but this is like hilarious. We ended up getting into a developed conversation the other day about lot lizards at truck stops and about glory holes and about my failed attempt to shoot my one and only glory hole movie and then I couldn't stop laughing and they had to redo my makeup multiple times. Like I not got to tell these kinds of stories. So I put a post out. We just wrapped our second season. So 10 more episodes in the can. They come out once a week. I'm so excited about it. And of course somebody writes, so what do you think? You're a comedian now? Now I know the tone of this person. I went to their page. They have no post. So they literally have a fucking instant just to troll. And I wrote back, not in a troll way, clarifying. I am not trying to say I'm a comedian. I am just the host. I get to sit in the center of this and jockey this thing back and forth. I explained myself to put that out there. And now I realize I'm going to have to do a video for my IG, letting everybody know I'm not trying to be a comedian. I'm just enjoying the broadcast experience that I got doing sports and parlaying it into my podcast, this podcast here, and now this show on comedy. Got a thick skin. I knew it was going to take this. I knew people were always going to throw their opinion out there because it's really hard for people to understand why I'm not doing what they want me to be doing. When somebody projects on me how upset they are that I'm doing something new, it's more because of the relationship that they have with something in my past. I want you all to have a healthy relationship with the things I did in my past. That's so important to me. That's why I did them. I'm still connecting with my fans regularly on OnlyFans because of my past. But there's a new me to add to that past and new conversations to be had. So what I'm doing now is hopefully putting that little sparkle on every potential opportunity for anybody that's in the industry now that says, hey, I had a really good time. I'm going to pick and choose and keep a couple of these things in my life. And then some of them I'm not going to do anymore and it's going to be okay. And we're all going to support that person and follow their pursuits and make sure that we have them on multiple podcasts and share their story. But the pivot needs to be a focused attempt and it's a long plan that is not easily executed but the amount of gratification i'm feeling from where i am right now is worth any bit of struggle that i ever felt so i'm glad that you've been following my journey as well as you following this podcast and all the incredible guests we have new season you enjoyed Addis fouché i'm sure and everybody that we're going to be surprising you with Share these episodes with your friends. I hope you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. You're following on social media. And also Lisa by Lisa Ann on Instagram. That is my wine that you can enjoy at all three locations of Sapphire here in New York City. Thank you for joining for a solo episode of Lisa Ann's Backstage Convos.